CTBK is more than just a full service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara community through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2020 and 2021 to keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400, and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you. Thank you, as always, for joining Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. I'm Tim Graham of The Athletic, here with Jonah Bronstein of the New Bronstein Times. Fresh off of his appearance Wednesday night at Riverworks, where he attended the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame induction, and uh, it was a smorgasbord of sports royalty from Western New York. I didn't get a chance to go. I had to write a story last night. Uh, I would like to have attended. Uh, but Jonah, what was uh, what was it like there? I, I understand that you were, uh, there's not a red carpet, is there? There is not. Your, your presence was missed and absence noted by a select few luminaries in the crowd. I, maybe I should clarify, I'm not being inducted into the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame. I think you were there to cover it. I'm sorry. I was, yeah, I didn't, I just, yeah. Someone like yourself, and there are media people in there. Milt Northrop's in that Hall of Fame and, I, and others, and I think there'll be a few other of our friends, Fs of the show, that could be into that hall at some point in time. Maybe you said a select few were asking about me. Who, who are these select few? It was really just friend of the show, Gene Kirshner. Buffalo News horse racing writer, who's also a board member for the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame. But you see a lot of local sports figures. They're either on the board there or they're friendly with someone who's being inducted. This wasn't the induction yesterday. It was an introduction of some of the uh, members of the class and Ryan Miller being the headliner of the class. And he was there. And you not always do you have the headline Bills or Sabres legend at this event. Last year, the the headliner of the fest was Kyle Williams. He didn't attend this. He didn't also attend the um, induction in October. This year, Ryan Miller was there. He had mentioned this was his first time coming back to Buffalo with his family, with his seven-year-old son and his wife, since he had been traded away. He's obviously been back here to play in games, but the first time coming back with his family and showing him the Buffalo area that he considers a home to him. He's born and raised in Michigan and went to college in Michigan, but this was the first time he had moved away from Michigan when he played for the Sabres and he spent 11 years here and considers this a home and called it a place of family folklore. And he was excited to bring his children here and show them where they used to live and different spots of Buffalo. And when I was leaving, I saw him and his son and Andrew Peters and his son were playing ball hockey at Riverworks. And it was kind of nice. That's what you get a lot of, um, Western New York and Buffalo pride from all the inductees, whether they're uh, natives of Western New York or they're professional athletes that played their career in Western New York, they all seem to be rooted in the community. And it's as much as they're being honored for their athletic exploits, uh, when they are here, they seem to be more proud to be representing Buffalo and Western New York and in this somewhat exclusive club of Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Famers. Uh, who, anybody else uh, other than Andrew Peters show up uh, to see Ryan Miller, any of his other former teammates? From what I saw, Patrick Coletta was there and Rick Jenneret was there. There may have been other former Sabres that I didn't uh, notice. There was also media members, you know, NHL hockey writers that probably wouldn't have covered this event, definitely wouldn't have covered this event without Ryan Miller there. And they were here to see Ryan Miller speak and be introduced. You know, some of them were asking, how do you cover something like this? Because they, they cover all of the NHL games, but they had never been to the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame introduction press conference at Riverworks, which is rather informal. It's pretty easy to just grab who you need and talk to them. But for someone like Ryan Miller, it was more of a official press conference for, for all the different P 
people and cameras that kind of wanted to capture what he said. And he's used to that. That's the thing about uh, being an NHL player and talking after every game, particularly a goaltender when, when you're in demand and that's a box that every journalist has to check before you leave the dressing room, you have to hear from the, the goaltender. Um, so he's had the microphones and the cameras in his face and probably, I don't know that he'd admit it, but maybe he missed it a little bit. So, you know, that he's going to be there and accommodating and whether it's a scrum or doing one-on-ones, he's been through this drill before, uh, and not one to, uh, and that's not to say that an Emily Reagan or, uh, another one of the, uh, inductees this year is, is running away from the attention, but it can be a bit overwhelming. Uh, when you're in a, a sport um, that is not a mainstream or a big four sport or playing on the major league level, there are a lot of people who get into the greater Buffalo sports hall of fame. And, and a lot of these types of regional halls of fame uh, that didn't do interviews at all because they were quietly doing what they do within their sport. Uh, maybe it's, uh, you know, uh, gymnastics or, um, volleyball, or even at a high school level, the Sweet Home High School volleyball team was inducted uh, as a unit, uh, uh, or is going to be inducted. I keep acting like last night was the induction. I keep using that that verb, but um, so yeah, you get a lot of people at these events where they're the star, uh, and I guess it's a an irony that they're they haven't been a star even at, at, during their their the peak of their career, a, a billiards player. Or, uh, I, don't know, I'm, I mean, you, you get the idea of a fly fisherman or, or something like that, uh, who was, uh, who did what they did and excelled and were the best in the world, but weren't exactly prone to, uh, pack journalism settings. And there was, I was a little disappointed to see just from my sensibilities, and this relates to the conversation we had on this pod last week, but there was a strong media contingent out there, um, specifically for Ryan Miller and everybody else was there and got introduced and got their photos taken. But aside from the Buffalo news, which does a good job of doing these individual profiles of each of the inductees spaced out between over the summer and and when the event comes up in the fall, but the television cameras and some of the other media there, it really seemed like they were, they were only interested in Ryan Miller and year as the years go by the bigger names and maybe not as interested in talking to and highlighting some of the athletes from the less heralded sports, or sometimes people get inducted posthumously and, you know, they obviously have been dead for a long time and they're putting in a women's professional wrestler, Cora Livingston, that won the world championship in 1910. And, you know, I think she died in 1947 or 1957. So it's hard to, hard to get a quote on that, but there, there were other people there that I, I kind of saw, it seemed like they wanted to be interviewed a bit more than they were being interviewed, but they do do a nice presentation on stage where everybody gets to say a nice note. And then at the induction in the fall, everybody gets to give a speech and get certain recognition. But you do see, as we see every day in the media around here, kind of the delineation between bills and sabers being of utmost importance, and especially the bills and everything else not being as important to many in the media. Yeah, totally. And one of the things that I find fascinating and I most look forward to each year the inductees are announced is, uh, although I'm not from Western New York originally, I've worked here for 22 years. And in working within here in the line of work that I do, um, I like to think that I've gotten to be deeply familiar with Western New York sports history inevitably every class has people I've never heard of to which I think to myself, now, where are they getting this guy? And every time you read the bio and you're like, yeah, <laughs> wow. You're like that this guy absolutely does be- belong in her. This woman did what, you know, it's uh, it's amazing. Uh, the, the rich history. And that's why a hall of fame like this exists is to make sure that these greats are not forgotten just because they didn't play in a sport that was, uh, that was shown on national television or got a lot of coverage. That's, I think that the, uh, the greater Buffalo sports hall of fame is for that person more than it's for Ryan Miller. Yeah, absolutely. And those tend to be 
the most fun stories to write. You do some research and you find some things that you didn't already know and you get to tell some stories that people don't already know all of the data points of like, and it's wonderful, I think, to acknowledge somebody like Ryan Miller, one of the greatest Sabres of all time and the best player in that era of Sabres history or a leader on that team. But a lot of the Ryan Miller story is already known and it can be a little bit uh, repetitive to retell his career story again. And, and a skilled writer can maybe find a new way to tell that for this Hall of Fame. But, but Ryan Miller is going to be back here and put into the Sabres Hall of Fame someday. He's probably going to have his jersey raised to the Raptors someday. I don't know if he's a pro hockey hall of famer. I've never ever really studied the numbers, but maybe the most, the most wins by an American goaltender in, in NHL history. I would think that Ryan Miller's in the, in the hockey hall of fame. Okay. So yeah, there'll be, that'll be a big event when that happens along those lines. So it's not really a very unique story to talk about Ryan Miller's career being enshrined in the greater Buffalo sports hall of fame, well, even though he case belongs in point, in there. Case in point, Jonah, um, both uh, Matthew Fairburn of The Athletic and I saw Mike Harrington of the Buffalo News, their stories about Ryan Miller uh, this week were about he hasn't been back in a while. Like that was the hook uh, yeah. because what else are you going to say about the guy? It's been written. Um, so you look for a little something a little unusual and it's like, hey, he's back in Buffalo, how much he loves Buffalo and what it's meant to him. Um, whereas a story on another of the uh, inductees this year is a deep dive into, uh, it's almost introductory. Uh, it's, it's like, get a load of this, you know, one thing after another, uh, besides, uh, towards the bottom of a, of a Ryan Miller story. Oh, by the way, uh, he won the Vezina and he went to however many all-star games and, uh, he has the most wins for an American goalie. Yeah. And then there's somebody like I, my focus yesterday was talking to Tim Wynn, formula sale basketball player from Niagara Falls played at St. Bonaventure. And he, and he doesn't come back all of the time. He lives in North Carolina, but he does come back somewhat frequently. And there've been different stories and he's been inducted into the Niagara Falls hall of fame as an individual. And with his state championship team from 1995 and 96, he's been inducted into the St. Bonaventure hall of fame. But as we talked to him about yesterday, this Hall of Fame is bigger than those Hall of Fames for him. It's a broader, you know, it's, it's bigger than one school or bigger than one town like Niagara Falls. And it includes all these different professional sp sports and athletes in different eras. So it's a kind of a crowning achievement. This is probably the biggest Hall of Fame that Tim Wynn will ever be inducted into. And you see athletes like that are quite proud to be in this company, whereas somebody who's a big time professional athlete, Bruce Smith has been inducted into this hall of fame, but he's in the pro football hall of fame. So this isn't quite that big of a deal for some of these really great professional athletes. And Bruce Smith's not from Western New York either. And of course, like you mentioned with Ryan Miller, you, it becomes an adopted hometown. It becomes a place where you, uh, in many cases, when you're, I'm talking about bills and sabers anyway, where you become a, a grown up. Um, it's a lot of times where you get married and start your family. And there's a lot of things that happen big in your life, but Tim Wim's from Western New York. Uh, and so, yeah, this is his hall of fame, probably more than it is, uh, uh the professionals who, who've played here. And I'm talking about the Braves and the bandits and, and any other, uh, professional outfit that, that gets accredited, uh, towards, uh, being eligible for this, for this hall of fame. And you mentioned Emily Regan. I don't know the exact data on this, but Emily Regan might be one of the youngest athletes I've seen get inducted into this Hall of Fame. It tends to, they don't make people wait a really long time, but you tend to get it a little bit when your career is over and more in the twilight of your career. And Emily Regan, I do think, has retired from active competitive. She's coaching at Boston University now, but um, she's in her early 30s, and that's pretty young for being put into any Hall of Fame, including this Hall of Fame. But I think it's an acknowledgement of the level that she reached winning a Olympic gold medal. Uh, not the only person from West New York that's won an Olympic gold medal, but that's a very short list. And I think there was a kind of an acknowledgement that somebody like that is a first ballot Hall of Famer, if you will, which Ryan Miller also had just recently retired from the NHL and kind of got that early induction nod from this committee. What are some, who do you think, uh, I'm trying to think uh, who's in it. I guess I don't know the full list because I might name some people who are already in. You mentioned Milt Northrup 
uh, as a sports journalist who's in the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame. Who else among journalists do you think uh, would get in? Who would be next? I would nominate Jerry Sullivan. I don't know if maybe you would wait until his career is over. Um, well, Milt Northrop's career wasn't over when he got inducted. That's true. Um, there's probably some older people that, you know, I don't know. I'd have to look at the list of who's in and who's not in, but some. Jim Kelly, is he in? I don't know if he is or is Jim he? Kelly, the hockey writer, not Jim yeah, Kelly, yeah. the quarterback. Uh, Larry Felser. So I would see if some of these older individuals are in there. And if they're not, I, you know, I'd start there. I do, I do believe Rick Azar is in, I, I, I would imagine. Van Miller, Miller Rick Jenneret is in. Yeah. John um, is not in, but he was honored with an award yesterday, the Dick Gallagher Legacy Award for what John Murphy did hosting Dick Gallagher's annual football banquet and some of the ways John Murphy highlighted high school sports and local sports when he was working at channel seven and channel four, I would think maybe John Murphy gets in someday um, probably more so for his being the voice of the bills for all these years, but something like that, it, you know, the committee is all locals or people with local connections. So I think if you are part of this community and, and, beloved in this community for various reasons that helps your candidacy as much as your athletic greatness or your broadcasting talent and things like that. Um, God, Vic Carucci had a long career covering the Buffalo Bills. Maybe he's somebody that gets honored in something like this someday. Jim Kelly is in. Uh, in fact, I attended that one. I should have remembered that off the top of my head because I wrote about it for the Buffalo News. I also was at his uh, when he received the, his award from the Hockey Hall of Fame up in Toronto. Uh, Ed Kilgore is in. Uh, Rick Azar is in. Uh, who was another one that you mentioned? Uh, Van Miller. Ben, I think we, we can. Van Miller is in. Uh, Ted Darling is in. Rick Jenneret is in. Uh, Van, um, anybody from the Courier Express, Phil Ranallo, or anybody that. Goes back that far. Eric Brady, maybe, perhaps, even though he's done a lot of his work outside of the area. He's from here and he does. Eric Brady should be in. Uh, he was an original uh, at the USA Today and just recently uh, left there. I'm talking about within the last couple of years. Um, I'm just going through the, uh, the website here. If we're going to bounce around, um, Eric Brady is not in uh, and should be. Um, I want to say there is another, uh, uh, oh, geez, you know, I should know this. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling, especially in, in a pinch here, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm drawing a blank. But anyways, um, Robert L. Smith, the photographer, is in. Right, that was last year. I know that everybody tunes into this podcast to listen to me uh, sort through uh, to search things on Jim McCoy. I think he might get in someday. I, he's been a photographer for a very long time with the Buffalo News, covering a lot of different sports. His retirement there. party is tomorrow. I guess he's eligible now. <laughs> right. Phil Ronaldo is in. All right. So yeah, there's a, there's a handful of, of media folks in here. You cannot sort by genre. Unfortunately, I would love to be able to do that uh, to see who the, the media folks are. Um, Al McGuire, uh, or I'm sorry, Paul McGuire, uh, who I'm sure didn't get in uh, based on his football playing, uh, but because of his work with uh, NBC and uh, uh and uh, Empire Sports Network. Anywho. How about Art Wander? Oh, Art Wander. Let's take a look. Joe Overfield, the author, he's in. No, Art Wander is not in. All right, there we go. As names pop up, I'll, I'll, I'll look them up, but uh, rather than me just scrolling through alphabetically uh, at all the different people. 
it is fun to kind of go through the list and all the names and see the different, the breadth of sports and eras and different type of people, professional and amateur athletes that have been acknowledged with this Hall of Fame induction over the years. Yeah, it is. And, uh, and again, it goes back to um, my joy in, in looking through these. And when I'm researching a story, especially on Buffalo history, I end up at the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame website. And you end up seeing names that you're like, all right, now, why, why is he in there? Um, and it's like it, you're it's just a great to, uh, reminder of, uh, of who these people are and to refresh your memory. Um, all right. I want to look up uh, Charlie Barton uh, and Dick Johnston. I'm guessing Dick Johnston is in. These are both uh, Elmer Ferguson award winners uh, right along with Jim Kelly for uh, the writer uh, for uh, writers, print journalists uh, honored by the, the hockey hall of fame. Um, Ron Muscotti, another Buffalo news photographer. He was inducted last year. Niagara Falls native. Well, this website isn't the easiest to navigate. Um, okay, so uh, what else did you learn uh, there at the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame, Jonah? Did you, uh, did you run into anybody interesting? I mean, I saw some people I'm friendly with. Friend Dick Johnston show. is not in. Well, there'll former, be another class coming down the line. Yeah, former Buffalo News columnist, uh, and he won the Elmer Ferguson Award in 1986. And uh, if Dick Johnston's not in, then Charlie Barton's probably not in. He won in 85 from the Buffalo Courier Express. Well, what are you going to do? Yeah, hopefully someday a media person that I'm friendly with, a Jerry Sullivan or a Tim Graham gets inducted, I can go kind of celebrate that. I don't know about that. Charlie Barton also not in. So that's two Elmer Ferguson Award winners. Um, and the Elmer Ferguson Award, by the way, is a Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, given by the uh, the Hockey Hall of Fame, established in 1984, and uh, anyways, so there's two two have been uh, two from Buffalo who aren't in the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame. But that's the beauty of it. Like we said, there are people who still deserve to get in every year. You take a look, and you got to wait your turn. One thing I I learned yesterday. I think this has been out there for a little while, but there's going to be a physical display at the Seneca one tower for the hall of fame. There had been one for years at the arena and it was taken away at some point in the past years. And now there's going to be an actual, I don't know how big it'll be, but an actual hall of fame that you can go and see the different names and that they have a Stanley cup style trophy where everybody's name is engraved on a different part of the structure. And I thought that's always cool, too, if you've ever covered one of these things. They have different artifacts and newspaper clips or the the 800, the 600 wins ball for Ole and coach Jeff Anastasia. That's kind of stuff is all out there to view in an event like this. And I think a good number of that stuff or photo, photographs of that stuff will be in this physical Hall of Fame. And I think that's cool because I don't think it's absolutely necessary, but it makes a Hall of Fame feel more real if you can kind of go and see it. Um, tactically it, in person when, when it's all online and digitized that's that's a nice honor but it doesn't seem to be like the same thing and it probably does belong at the arena but the arena isn't always open to the public so maybe something in something like the Seneca one tower that can be accessed almost any point in time is a more appropriate place for it uh i want to tie together uh your time at the greater Buffalo sports hall of fame to my recent satchel, which is what I call my mailbag uh, at the athletic and Ryan Miller almost made the cut. He was because uh, he was a thoughtful interview. He's one of my favorite guys to talk to uh, a deep thinker. 
but a reader asked for my uh, Mount Rushmore of Buffalo sports figures uh, as in terms of being an entertaining interview. So there were caveats to this question. I couldn't uh, necessarily pick my favorite interview or the most um, groundbreaking interview or whatever. So my Mount Rushmore for most entertaining Buffalo sports figures uh, were Daniel Briere, Stevie Johnson, uh, Lee Smith, the former Bills tight end, and Lindy Ruff, uh, the coach. But I had, uh, as honorable mentions, I was going to put some honorable mentions together and the list got a little too unwieldy. Uh, but I had, uh, from hockey, I had Rob Ray, Marty Baran, Teppo Newmanen, Ryan Miller, Botslav Verada, who I wanted to put on my Mount Rushmore badly, uh, and because it's it, there's a variety to, to this uh, to this um, profession. Uh, and Botslav Verada, much like another person on my honorable mentions, Yaroslav Spachek, colorful guys, straight shooters, and also English as a second language. Um, you know, I, I would talk about this with hockey writers uh, because I think. Well, but there's baseball also, but uh, hockey writers and growing uh, chance of this when you're covering the NBA, but you get international uh, athletes who have English as second language and they, there's no filter. It's hard to translate. It's almost as though, uh, you know, they're translating word for word what they mean out of their native language into English and you lose the art of you know, sarcasm or getting cute with words or semantics, you know, you try to, you can play a word game as an athlete. If you're, if you're experienced enough, I'm just saying athletes, anyway, politicians, uh, anybody, you can artfully answer a question without answering it. You know, it's a skill, but when you're doing it in a second language, uh, that filter is uh, hard to develop. And so uh, Václav Verada, after any game, was a fantastic person to interview because he couldn't help himself. And he wanted to be honest, and he was honest. Uh, Yaroslav Spachek, the same way, uh, but maybe a greater sense of humor. Spachek had a, had a, was, was a funny dude. Uh, and then, uh, and I'd like to hear yours, Jonah, from, from uh, your career also. Um, people that you've encountered. And then from the Bills, I had Kyle Williams, Marshawn Lynch, Richie Incognito, Ryan Fitzpatrick, and Brian Scott, uh, the defensive back. Um, just so engaging, Brian Scott was. And in fact, I exchanged texts with him last week. His name came up in a story I was researching. I saw uh, he was in the box score, and I was like, ah, I sent Brian Scott a text. And he got back to me in 30 seconds and we had a text conversation for the next half hour. Just a great guy. But um, your thoughts, Jonah, who would be on your Mount Rushmore? Yeah, I'm trying to roll through my, I don't know if Rolodex is the right word, but rolling through just different names and thoughts and memories. Um, I don't have as much experience just in terms of going back as many years and covering as many professional sports and professional athletes as you do. Um, and it's hard for me to come up with the four and say the, and rank them and say, these are the four, but the first one's the pop of my, the one that's definitely on there is Kelvin Murphy. Uh, if people don't know, he played at Niagara and as a pro basketball hall of famer from his career with the Houston Rockets. And he's just a very colorful personality, a very talkative person who has a great recollection of his own life and his own time and telling his own stories. And if you needed to, uh, talk to him, he would come back to Niagara every so often and, it was very easy. He'd fill your notebook and it was very easy to write a story based on the things that he would say on all different topics. I mean, he came back the first time and I thought, all right, that's it. And then he came back a couple of years later and there was all new anecdotes and tales and fun things. And he's a guy that's in broadcasting and does radio. So, and I think that helps a lot. People that are used to talking and comfortable talking about themselves and somebody who's modest, which is uh, a personality trait that you might enjoy in somebody, but you don't enjoy that when you're interviewing a modest person. You kind of want somebody that's a little bit braggadocious and wants to talk about themselves on and on and on and can remember things about them. Draymond Green would be fun to interview on a daily basis. Absolutely. Whether you like him or not. Yeah, yeah. Jeremy Roenick. Uh, you know, there's Richie Incognito, whatever you thought of him. Um, I had a, a, and thankfully for this question in, in the satchel, 
the person said Buffalo. He qualified it as Buffalo because then I might have had to go with Joey Porter from when I covered the Miami Dolphins. Uh, he was one of those guys that every day I walked into the Dolphins locker room and said, I am not going to interview Joey Porter today. Sure enough, there's a couple reporters around his locker and I think, shit, I got to go over there and see what he's saying just in case. And he always said something uh, that was thought provoking or controversial or deep. You know, he was he was just one of those guys. Tim Wynn, who I spoke with yesterday, I don't know if I really ranked him, if he'd definitely make the top four, but he's always been fun to talk to about his career. Uh, he remembers a lot about playing in Niagara Falls and playing at St. Bonaventure and enjoys talking about those things and is uh, accessible and talkative. Uh, for me, I cover mostly local high school and college sports, even though I do also cover the professional sports. And you find that, it, you know, the coaches are always more quotable. And the athletes, it's rare. Sometimes you do find some young athletes that are very talkative and very quotable, but they either are shy, well, more often than not, the young athletes are shy or nervous or just don't have the lived experience or because of their age, the ability to tell their own stories, the insightfulness that I think comes with age. Sometimes they don't even have, if they're young enough, they don't even have, have done enough to really, if you're interviewing some, sometimes you interview a really excellent eighth grader in female sports that happens maybe more than the male sports and they just haven't done enough or learned enough about life to really talk about themselves and it's easier to talk to their parents or an older they have a hard time talking to the teacher that they're in class with five days a week then uh they that's difficult uh and now here's a guy from the niagara gazette showing up to interview them uh and they know that these words are going to be read by all their classmates (laughs) Yeah, yeah, you might as well ask them to stand up and give them a, give a book report in front of a bunch of strangers. Right. And they don't want to say the wrong thing. A lot of times you'll ask a question and an athlete will be kind of looking at you to think, is that what I was supposed to say? Or they're trying to, it's almost like I'm a teacher asking them the questions and they want to have the right answers. And maybe they don't know what the right answer is, or they're having trouble coming up with that on the spot. And I try to tell them, just talk, just say something and, and I'll pick out what's good and I won't make you look stupid. And sometimes that works and they and they open up a little bit and sometimes it doesn't especially with college athletes they don't want to say anything that their coach is going to read that they don't like or that the PR person the SID has trained them to speak in certain ways college I athletes kind of, are probably the most micromanaged athletes right you know, high school you don't have those barriers and in the NFL or the major league baseball they don't care as much but college, you are tied down. I mean, everything is about the, the university's brand pretty much. Yeah. And there are some coaches that won't let you, that won't let an athlete talk until they're a junior or until they're a senior. You, know, you, you don't talk to Tim Tebow. I think the first interviews Tim Tebow did when he was, you know, and he was on his Heisman candidate and all this other stuff was at the, in the bowl games because it's contractually obligated his freshman year, he was a superstar and hadn't done an interview until he got to the bowl game. Yeah. And every interview with a college athlete for the most part is chaperone or in a press conference setting. And they get the media training where they're told how to answer certain questions and what to say and what not to say. And then it becomes a bit of a performance for that SID and that media training person than it is actually to speak to the media and speak to the fans. Sometimes with high school players, athletes, you'll get a good quote because they don't know enough to know what they're not supposed to say. And they might give you an honest and authentic thought that if they had been a little bit older and knew what they were not supposed to say, wouldn't have said that thing. I find, and maybe you find this too, retired athletes or athletes that are beyond, that that don't compete anymore. And they're not, they didn't make it to the professionals are much more candid and open and talking about things that happened in the past. And they wouldn't have been, as willing to tell you those stories in the moment. Uh, Maybe that's natural with everybody, but you find the older an athlete gets, the more um, willing they are to kind of give you their honest and open and authentic thoughts and not just say the sound bites that they think sounds good and should be in the paper or should be on uh, the highlight package. I enjoy certain athletes that maybe I covered in high school and then I covered them in college. And if they're good enough and lucky enough to make it to the pros, you get to catch up with them again. And 
when they know you, they're a little bit more open and they're a little bit more trusting in, in telling you things and saying things. And then combined with being older and having more to say and more skill at expressing themselves, they become better interviews and you can kind of bring up things from the past that they know about and that gets them going. So like Paul Harris was somebody who I didn't actually cover him in high school, but then I covered him early in his Syracuse career and he wasn't the best interview. He wasn't always getting along with Jim Beheim and they had kind of a tightly controlled situation there. And then when he left Syracuse, I got to know him better and write about him more. And he got more talkative. And now, now he's past his career, but he still plays overseas, but he's an adult in his thirties with kids and he's much more talkative and willing to talk about his career and younger athletes. And so it's fun kind of watching people progress as, as individuals and as interview subjects. How about coaches? Uh, I had Lindy Ruff on my Mount Rushmore. So if I were to limit it to only coaches, obviously he would have one of the four spots. Um, but I'm going through the, the NFL and NHL coaches that I covered and I'm having trouble. Uh, maybe Wade Phillips, maybe, uh, Rex Ryan, definitely not. Uh, I think that the Jets Rex Ryan was fascinating. Uh, and I was at ESPN covering the AFC East at the time. So, uh, but by the time he got to Buffalo, he was using all the same tricks or at least trying all the same shots, you know, pulling that club out of his bag that, that worked with the New York media, thinking that it was going to work again with the Buffalo media or nationally. And people were like, you've done this already. And it just, the phoniness uh, started to come through a little bit more uh, the showman uh, more than, man, this guy really shoots from the hip that we thought he did it with the Jets. And yeah, I, obviously there is some shooting from the hip, but he was he was saying things just for effect more than uh, I think that he really meant it. Um, so I wouldn't put Rex Ryan on my list. I certainly wouldn't put Dick Duran or Greg Williams or, you know, maybe Chan Gailey. Um, but Gailey I th- would be, as far as Bill's coaches that I've covered, the wasn't always quotable, but he didn't play the same games that other coaches play where they're trying to keep everything as close to the vest and say as little as possible. He went out there and kind of told you what was on his mind and was, if not always quotable, he was always, I don't know the word I'm searching for there, but he was always, you you didn't really regret asking Chan Gailey a question. You usually got, what you were looking for from asking him a question. Chan knew the power of semantics and he tried, uh, but he also was too honest to lie to you. He wouldn't lie. So uh, there are two instances, the Chan Gailey that come to mind right off the top of my head. Number one, it was at an NFL owners meeting and I'm sitting with him talking about Aaron Maben's development, where Aaron Maben stands with the Buffalo bills. And it clearly wasn't working out. And I, and and Chan was trying to be diplomatic about it, how it wasn't working out. And I said, and I'm paraphrasing, I said, is it, does it come down? Is it effort or skill or is it effort or I can't know, but it was basically is, is the guy lazy? Uh, And he looked me dead in the eye and he said, Aaron Maben works hard. And it was kind of like, he was like looking at me like, I'm answering your question for you, and I'm not, but I'm not going to say it. And it was pretty much, he just didn't have it. And, and with Darren Maven, it was his size. He just wasn't big enough to be a, a pass rusher in the defense that Dave Wanstead uh, wanted him to play or George Edwards, uh, whoever the defensive coordinator was at the time. Uh, and then he was able to go to the Jets and they used him in only pass rushing situations. He ends up leading the Jets in sacks and forced fumbles one season. Um, because his size didn't matter nearly as much as it did in the, in the, the way that the bills played their defense. Um, and then the other time uh, with Chan Gailey uh, was uh, the bills were playing in San Francisco and then in Arizona on back-to-back weeks. And they ended up staying out in California to practice that week. And we were uh, and they were practicing at the hotel. It had a space for them. They had a field set up and Mark Anderson uh, the high priced uh, edge rusher that they signed uh, the same season that they signed Mario Williams in uh, 2012 uh, was hurt and it looked bad. He got hurt in the San Francisco game. And we were talking to him about Anderson and maybe Mario Williams might've been hurt too. Anyway, there were some injuries and it got a little frustrating for me because he wasn't, he, he said, I don't know. 
he was saying something along the line about would they be available on Sunday? And he said, he kept saying, I don't know. And I said, finally, I said, Chan, is it that you don't know or you don't want to tell us? And I was kind of, cause I, my thought was it's a bad look for the coach to not know. Like it was a, it was getting late in the week and I was just like, and he said, and he looked at me and he says, I don't want to tell you, you know, and he always used to, he had a, he always had a pouch in the front of his shirt, whether it was a golf, one of those uh, wind shirts or, or a hoodie or something. And he always had a mail bag of mail pouch uh, tobacco in there for his, you know, plug a chew. And he would always kind of fondle this, this bag of tobacco in his, in his pocket while he was talking to the media. And uh, he was just kind of like, all right, I, I just don't want to tell you. Uh, and I was like, all right, I can respect that. I don't need to know, but you know, I have a feeling that you're aware of, of this guy's injury at this point. It's been three days since the game. Buddy Nix was great too. And, and I'm thinking. And still is. And, and I guess, you know, yeah. Chan is still, you know. That era, if you have a talkative and media friendly general manager and a talkative and open and honest head coach, is that, did that also trickle down to the players or was it a coincidence that some of the media favorite players, the Ryan Fitzpatrick and Stevie Johnson and Fred Jackson, uh, even early in Eric Wood's career. Was it a coincidence that they all played under these GM? Kyle coaches, Williams. Kyle Williams. Or was that part of the organizational culture that uh, being somebody that the media enjoyed interviewing was part of the culture in the building at that time? No, I think it is coincidence because it, around those times was probably the or any time after Marv Levy, maybe, I don't know, but that, that Bill's media relations staff were micromanagers. They, they created divisions between the reporters and the players. Don't trust this guy. We're not doing this. Uh, whether it was trying to reach, you know, Russ Brandon or talk to anybody, you could not get access. It was very difficult. I have a, so a story which I don't know if I've told on the air and in, in the podcast, but um, this is a this is how difficult the Bills media relations staff was when I uh, started covering them, and it had to have happened before I started covering them in 2008 for a for uh, ESPN when I covered the AFC East. Um, so within a couple of months of me working for ESPN, I had Rex Ryan's cell number. I had Mike Tannenbaum's cell number. He's the general manager of the Jets at the time. Um, I had Bill Parcell's cell number. He was the uh, president or vice president of football operations or something like that for the Miami Dolphins. Um, I could get Jeff Ireland, the Dolphins general manager, uh, pretty quickly on the phone through the PR staff. I had maybe we're going now six months into my time with uh, ESPN. I had gotten uh, three one on one interviews with Bill Belichick on three requests. I was three for three, but I could not get Russ Brandon, the guy who talks to everybody, trying to go through the proper channels of the Buffalo Bills media relations staff. I could not get Russ Brandon uh, on the phone for an interview. Uh, to which it was always, no, he doesn't want to do it. He doesn't want to do it. Well, years late, fast forward years later, I asked him about that. And he said, what? He's like, I've never turned down an interview request. It was because the media relations department didn't want me to talk to him. Uh, it felt so, uh, it, but uh, so Scott Birch told who ran the, the media relations department, this is, this is one of the, the, the head scratchers uh, of my career. And it's a story I like to tell over a couple of beers. So, um, the NFL every year comes out with what's called its black book. And it's like, you know, the, the stare, the, you know, the old uh, traditional black book of a guy with all the, it's all phone numbers and it's all the phone numbers of all the people you need to contact in the NFL, people in the media, all the media relations, people, um, community relations. It's got information on in there for how to get to the stadium from various parts of town uh, the ta numbers for the cab companies. It's all the things that you need to do to cover their team when you're traveling on the road or need to get them on the phone, all this stuff. It has email addresses, office numbers, home numbers, cell numbers. Okay. So the only team 
that did not list its cell phone numbers out of all the teams in the NFL were the Buffalo Bills. They would not give out the cell numbers for their PR people. Scott Birch told, did not give me ever his cell phone number. I covered the team for ESPN. And then after three years, covered the team for the Buffalo News. Did not give me his cell phone number. Would not give me his cell phone number. Uh, he kept saying, just call me at home. And that's a folksy thing that you you know like to say, just call me at home anytime. Well, the thing is, is he never answered that phone. It always, I always thought it maybe went to a fax machine. I don't know. He wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't return calls left at his office. He wouldn't answer the phone at home. Uh, and so finally, I had another reporter out of sympathy, out of mercy, gave me Scott Birchtoll's number. He's like, this is ridiculous. How can you not have Scott Birchtoll's number? He covered, he's the head PR guy of the team you cover, of the team that you break news on. Uh, and no, I didn't deserve it. And from, from talking to other people, that was the way he operated. So yeah, that was Chan Gailey's PR guy. That was that was Doug uh, Dick Duran and and Greg Williams and Wade Phillips. Wade Phillips, by the way, his home phone number was in the phone book wherever he worked. I was that's a favorite bit of trivia of mine. Um, but yeah, that's how the Bills PR staff was locked down. F you, uh, unless you could do them favors. You know, if you had a vote for the Pro Football Hall of Fame, uh, All Pro awards. Um, if you could do things for them, then you, then you had access. Um, and when there were times, uh, that, uh, you would get it anyways, I'm going down, I'm going down a rabbit hole now too, but all kinds of weird things with that PR staff, just not healthy, not good, not good for the beat, not good for getting your message out there for your branding. It was very exclusionary team, especially for the, the second smallest market in the NFL. Um, to make th- to make it difficult for you to cover the team was was always mind boggling to me. Well, that's what you get. The bigger the sport is, and the bigger the media presence is, uh, you know, because a lot of when you're covering high school or college or minor league sports that don't get as much media attention, you might be the only reporter there, and one that makes the interview easier, or even if it's just small scrum. It's a lot easier to have these conversations with people when there are several cameras and there are many different media people taking turns with the questions. I think the athletes are much more at ease and it's easier to get your questions in and have more of a conversation than a group interrogation. But also, if they get less media, they're more excited to see a reporter come out to a practice on a certain day or they're eager to tell their story that hasn't been told yet, whereas NFL athletes they're obligated to do the media, not every day, but regularly. And the coaches are obligated to speak to the press almost every day during the season. And it's a lot more guarded and let's get this over and done with as quick as possible. And you don't get quite as many authentic conversations style quotes. You, If you are lucky enough to get a one-on-one interview, sometimes you can get that, but it's more rare. And somebody like LeBron James, uh, you really only get prepared statements from him most often of the time because he's been interviewed so much and everybody wants to interview him so much that it's really like a celebrity coming out and giving a performance than it is trying to have a real conversation with a real person and a real athlete. But a lot of athletes will then say they want to be treated like real people. And I think they, they do, but the, the system and the media presence makes it difficult for them to do that in those settings with so many cameras and so many reporters and so many eyeballs on them at certain times. That's one of the reasons that Ryan Fitzpatrick was so loved uh, by the media. And obviously he's not on the level of LeBron James, but uh, he comes to mind because he announced his retirement uh, a few days ago. Um, But it is customary in the NFL um, that the quarterback speaks only twice a week. He speaks on Wednesday and he speaks after the game. And that is it. Whereas other players uh, are to be made available after every practice session. Now the rule is this, um, a team is allowed unless it's changed, but, and, and you know, it's a wrinkle maybe with COVID and now that we're coming back, uh, I'm not sure where things stand, uh, but the way it has always been, um, a team is allowed to designate two players and two players only on the entire roster who can be made available once a week because of the crush of 
media attention. Um, when I was covering the Dolphins, it was whoever the quarterback was and Jason Taylor. Usually it's an offensive player and a defensive player. Um, <laughs> the New England Patriots used to stretch it. They had six or seven, and they waited for the writers to complain to the Pro Football Writers Association or to the NFL. But, you know, the Patriots had Tom Brady, of course, but also Vince Wilfork and Wes Welker and Randy Moss, and they had a bunch of people. Um, Ryan Fitzpatrick's the only quarterback I've ever known who was available every day. He would speak at the, at the lectern on Wednesdays, which is the traditional day when quarterbacks around the league do it. But if he was at his locker on Thursday or Friday or Monday or whatever, you could walk up to him and talk to him and you wouldn't have a, because he let it be known that he was okay with it. You wouldn't have a PR guy coming over to say, oh, no, 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 you're not allowed to talk to him. And that's the, the way it would be. I mean, and it's, it's, you would think that being in a professional setting, reporters and, and team officials, uh, dealing with each other on a regular basis uh, that there isn't this kind of confrontation, but in, with a lot of teams, it is that way. The bills aren't that way anymore. Let me just stress that the, the regime I was talking about has been gone for a few years. The, the bills PR staff now is pretty open. Um, it's difficult. A couple of players are difficult to talk to in one-on-one -on -one situations. Of course, a lot of that has had to do with the COVID restrictions. For instance, you can't just get Stefan Diggs whenever you want. Um, you can't just get Josh Allen whenever you want, but they listen to pretty much every request. Um, Tredavious White's a tough one. He doesn't just doesn't like to do interviews. Matt Milano just doesn't like to do interviews. However, they are available and you can walk up to them and talk to them if you want. Chances are they're going to say no, thanks. Uh, but in a lot of cases, if you walk up to somebody at their locker, you'd start taking two steps towards somebody who's supposed to be off limits and you have somebody sprinting over. Uh, to get in between you, like the get back guy on the, uh, you know, on the uh, college basketball team after somebody hits a three, you know, it's like, uh -uh, no, 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 you can't talk to him. No, 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 no. He's off limits. It's like, hey, we're human beings. Can I ask this guy where he got those shoes? You know, am I allowed to say like, hey, dude, uh, you know, hey, I, I really enjoyed what you did with you know, that charity event or, you know, no, you, it's like there's a paranoia of you do not talk to this guy. Um and it's, a, and it's 10 times worse at the college level. There's a status element to it, too. I remember LaShawn McCoy, he would speak once a week, and he was usually a pretty good interview in those settings, and maybe that was on a Wednesday. And then it would be on a Thursday, and he'd be sitting at his locker staring at his phone or pretending to stare at his phone and doing nothing, but you couldn't talk to him. He spoke yesterday, and yeah. there was no more to say or no more to ask. And only certain players of a certain prestige are really get away with that. Or, or maybe – there's other ones. I know, remember Corey Graham, a Buffalo local that played for the Bills for a couple of years. If you ever go to try to interview him, he would say no at first, but it was kind of like a little joke he would always do. And you'd sort of have to sit, sit that out for a couple of seconds. And then he'd be like, oh, OK, yeah, I'll talk. To you. Marshawn Lynch had a had a move and it worked probably 99 times out of 100 where he would say no. And but he was making you work for it. He kind of wanted to see how badly you needed to talk to him because a lot of times he'd say no. And the reporter would turn on his heels and walk off and go talk to Fred Jackson. Um, but there were a couple of times where I really wanted to talk to him and he eventually would, he'd be like, all right, I, re I respect the, the hustle type thing. Like, all right, you really need to talk to me. And then he'd talk and he'd be great. Well, I remember Lynch, one, or, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I remember one time where, and he always had a PR guy lurking too, because they needed to know what Marshawn was going to say so that before it hit the, the paper or the internet, uh, they weren't necessarily going to put a stop to it, uh, but they needed to know what Marshawn was saying. Stevie Johnson, similarly, because you never know it was going to come out of his mouth. Um, but I remember talking to Marshawn. He was having a contract situation. He always was, you know, I, they drafted CJ Spiller. And I was talking to him and it came up that he'd been playing a lot of Madden and uh, PR guy standing by. And I said, Oh yeah, which, uh, which team do you like to play as? Or I said something about playing as the bills. And he's like, no, nah, man, it, I've, I've been playing as the jets. That's a fun team. And I could see the shoulders of the PR guy just slump that Marshawn, because this is when they were loading up with uh, 
uh, Braylon Edwards, you know, Mark Sand. This is when they went to back to back AFC title games. Uh, they had LaDainian Tomlinson and Rex Ryan was coaching and they were just collecting a bunch of players. Darrell Revis was hot. And, um, you know, I just, <laughs> and I think, but I also got the impression, and I don't know because I never followed up with him about it. I got the impression that Marshawn said that because the PR guy was there and he just wanted to, wanted to fuck with him. Uh, and he was like, here you go. Here's something you can write about. And uh, that's, that's why Marshawn almost made my Mount Rushmore. But you had to be able to figure. And of course, everybody knows with, you know, I'm here just so I won't get fined. You weren't going to crack that nut at the Super Bowl. He was dug in. But he would just try to want to see how badly you needed it. And after a while, he'd say, OK, I'll, I'll give the interview. I had a similar situation with Manny Ramirez when he was uh, playing with the Bisons on a rehab assignment. Uh, he was having a problem with the Indians coming back from an injury. Um, I walked into I was I was filling in for Mike Harrington, I guess. And everybody wanted to know what was up with Manny Ramirez and nobody could get him to talk. And one day I went in there and he said no. And I said something like, Hey, look, man, I'm just, I'm just, you know, trying to make a, you know, you put a gig, you go hat in hand, a little funny. You try to make him laugh. And he was like, all right. And he was like, whatever. And he gave me a similarly to Marshawn Lynch. He said, maybe I'll just play in the minors for the rest of the season because he wanted out of Cleveland. And that was huge headline. And it turned into a big thing. Uh, I had the, I'm sitting in the, sitting in the, in the press box covering then the Bison's game that I had to cover. I have my story, obviously. I'm writing about Manny Ramirez and what he had to say. And now the the Cleveland Plain Dealers Indians writer is calling me saying, how'd you get him to talk? you like, I fucking asked him. And when he said no, I asked him uh, and, and I tried to joke with him. And he thought I he thought it was funny. So he, he, I kneeled down at his locker for 10 minutes and he talked. You know, it's it, it's it's I mean, look, I don't want to say it's not that hard because I think it is. It's difficult for one human being to walk up to another who you think doesn't know you and really doesn't. Manny Ramirez, you know, passing through the Bison's clubhouse, doesn't know the writer from the Buffalo News. But I'm sure Marshawn Lynch knew who I was. Uh, but it's difficult to walk up to somebody knowing that they're going to tell you no or they might say something or give you the cold shoulder. And when they do, you're like, all right, I tried, you know, or it's to make the phone call, the difficult phone call and hoping it goes to voicemail. There's part of me that says like, fuck, I just don't want to talk to this guy, but I have to, I own the call. And sometimes it goes to voicemail. Sometimes they pick up. Um, but there's that, that angst as you approach somebody for an interview. And if they say no, your immediate reaction is like, okay, thanks. And then you walk away. Um, you have to, you have to try a little harder than that. It's common sense, but that doesn't mean it's easy, I guess. No, it's, it's not easy. And like, like you said, there's sometimes when you're not hoping that they don't answer, but you're assuming that they won't answer and it's nerve wracking if they do. And then you, you kind of were right. prepared for the, the no comment. And then you do have to ask your questions. And sometimes they answer and they don't want to ask the question, answer the questions anyways. Jonah, tell your story of when you were asked to, uh, when the New York Post uh, asked you to uh, do an assignment for them. Oh, okay. So yeah, right. So the New York, I don't know if it was the post, I guess it doesn't matter. It was one of the New York papers had wanted me to go knock on the door of Bob Miskey. Well, it would only be the New York post or the New York daily news. Cause I don't think the New York times or Newsday yeah, would, would have I think it would have these. I actually think it might've been Newsday, but um, Bob Miskey, what I, is he in the greater Buffalo sports hall of fame? I think he might be. He uh, is. Yeah. Played at UB played multiple sports at UB and uh, was a basketball official and a baseball scout for the Yankees for many, many years. And he had gotten into a point where he was let go by the Yankees and suing the Yankees over age discrimination. And the Newsday, if it wasn't Newsday, it was New York Post, wanted me to go knock on his door. So I was right. I remembered it better than you did. Perhaps. I don't know if it was. I'd have to look that up. Ah, damn it. Um, Did you get a byline? I'll look it up while you're telling the story. Well, I I think I got a contribute line, but... He didn't say too much, but so Bob Miskey knows my father, probably knew my grandfather too, but definitely knew my father. They ref together years and years ago. I had seen him once or twice at a UB game and he was happy to say hello and, um, you know, tell me who I was and find out who I was. And when I knocked on the door and said who I was, he was very friendly and very happy to open the door and say hello. 
when I explained why I was there and I also had photographer John Hickey was right there to take his photo. That door closed very, very quick. And he was nice and respectful about it, but he did not want to say anything. And it was a situation where I think his lawyer had advised him, don't say anything, it could hurt the lawsuit. And so that's how it went. And I, that was what I worked into the story. I didn't have a quote, but it was a no comment and a quick closing of the door. And I'm looking through my old email to see. Uh, it's the New York Daily News. I have the story here in front of me. Um, so you were right. You were correct. And you have the lead byline, uh, Jonah Bronstein and Stephen Rex Brown in uh, August of 2016. It's all good now, Yankees. Scouts honor a revered baseball scout who charged he was unceremoniously fired by the New York Yankees and told to turn in his radar gun because he was too old has settled his suit against the storied franchise. Or no, that seems like a follow-up story, huh? It was a follow-up story. The story had already been out there about the lawsuit and they needed, wanted me to go get some reaction. Oh, I see. Okay. But what's it like as you're walking up the, the stairs, uh, to, to this guy's front door right before you knock. You, you, you I'm know, sure you're not thrilled to be there. In that case, I was a little bit confident because I, you already know, when you already know somebody, it does make it a little bit That's easier true. when That's they know true. you, because you're going to get a, a human salutation. They might, as the case happened here, not want to talk to you on the record, but they're not going to, you know, sick their dog on you for knocking on their door. Um, I haven't had to do this many times, but a journalist needs this in their tool belt. Sometimes you have to knock on the door of somebody who's just lost a family member or, I don't know, might be accused of a crime. And it can be a very nerve wracking situation to try to get that person. It's hard to do on the telephone. It's probably even harder to do in person. But having that badge around your neck and being a journalist, uh, it makes you a little bit more bolder than you would be in your own personal life. And hey, if they say no, that's always kind of the easiest thing I asked. And they said, no, sometimes it's more difficult. Right. That's what I'm talking about with Marshawn Lynch and Manny Ramirez. You would walk up and you, I try, and then you could go back to your, your seat and get, get behind your laptop and start typing with the, with the knowledge that I tried. Uh, and that's a peace of mind, but that doesn't, you're not going to get the story that way. It's so more, it's more difficult when they get to talking, but they want to tell you, Hey, don't print this, or this is off the record, or they say one thing on the record. And then they tell you something else that's a little bit contradictory. And then you have to decide whose confidence do you betray this person that told you not to write this or to write it in a certain way, or do you have to, and you should kind of act on the public's behalf or the newspaper that you're representing's behalf and print the truth. And sometimes you have to parse between what is, relevant and what is not relevant and how you handle that. And with me in the local sports, you get to know people very well and you'll turn the recorder on and they say one thing and then you'll talk to them for an hour after and they say a whole bunch of other different things. And you have to make certain judgments as to what makes it into your story and what does it. And sometimes you have to tell people, Hey, I, I got to write that even though you don't want me to. Right. Yeah. It's a difficult part of the job. Um, before we, uh, well, I'm I, real, real quick. Uh, and I, maybe I'll post a link to it. It reminds me of a story. I, I did a story that the inspiration was getting doors slammed in your face. Um, this was that, uh, that one year at the Buffalo news when I wasn't covering sports and I could come up with ideas and anything that was interesting. And I wanted to do a story on Mormon missionaries who go door to door um, trying to get people to convert to Mormonism or at least listen. And I don't know how I got the idea, but I, maybe somebody had come to my door. I know what it was. There's a company that comes through my neighborhood from spring until fall, probably three or four times a month trying to sell me new windows. And it's the same company and it's oftentimes the same guy or kid, I should say, they're, they're not grownups, to sell me new windows. And I, I got to the point where I'm thinking, what the fuck kind of job is this? You know, I guess it's something you got to do. It's a, it's a try. And then I started to think like of people going to door to door in general, you know, the old encyclopedia salesman, that's uh, people used to make their living go to door, going door to door selling things. And then I think I settled on the Mormon missionaries and how 
you that that has to be the most uh, confrontational upset that somebody can be when you get knocked on the door and they want to convert you to a different religion. Uh, and so I, I decided I wanted to tell a story of how do you how do you do this? How do you mentally go from door to door, having it slammed in your face, rejection after rejection, and just keep doing it every day? Um, and so I did a story where I, I, um, <laughs> I guess, embedded myself with some Mormon missionaries and went door to door uh, in uh, in the North Towns. And then I stood back and didn't say much. I mean, I wasn't embedded. I wasn't active. I was an observer. And then on the particularly colorful ones, I went back to those houses and interviewed them. Um, Like, why did you act the way you did? Uh, What is it that's so annoying? Uh, And they all, they were happy to talk to me. And there's like, I was busy. I have things to do. Um, I I have no, you know, so it was, it was an enlightening story. So anyway, that's just my thing about getting, getting door slammed in your face. I mean, it's got to just be nerve wracking those five seconds before you ring that doorbell. I mean, your, your endorphins have to be going. You just know you're, you, you might get MF'd. Um, you, who knows what's going to happen? Well, in these days, people don't just show up and knocking on the door. Maybe if they're door to door salesmen, but nowadays you send a text or a phone call before you go to somebody's house. So if some stranger's knocking on the door, unless it's, you know, election season and somebody's going around handing out pamphlets or getting, signatures um it's an awkward situation no matter what and nobody's probably really respecting it expecting it to be a reporter i wanted to ask you how many times have you been interviewed i know you probably have been interviewed a time or two i don't know i don't need the number but have you found that's you know what how do you feel about being on the other side of it when somebody's asking you to give your thoughts and feelings and do you find that it's easy to do because you interview people for a living or is it difficult to be on the other the opposing side of that issue um i don't like it because i know i ramble anybody who listens to this podcast knows it i talk things out i'm not quick with the sound bite uh, i need to work it out mentally you know or in my mind uh, as i'm and i'm i generally don't have the ability to do that i could sit and ponder for a few minutes but um but I also turn off the anxiety aspect of that because I have done the job. So I know that this is how it's, it is. I'm going to talk this out and this person has the right to use whatever part of my quote they want to use. If they want to use the best part, they will. Uh, if they decide that they, they don't, you know, I have no control over it. So um, yeah, I know I'm not a great interview subject uh, because I, I just don't speak succinctly enough for that, but I also don't, let it bother me because I know, I think if, if I were a a athlete or a politician or somebody who got interviewed on the, on a regular basis, I don't think I'd be comfortable with it. It's hard to speak as well as you or I try to write because you're able to rewrite and kind of think about how you want to phrase things. And when we're just talking, even just like on this podcast, but I remember a few years back, there was a UB player that had grad transferred down to Georgia tech. I kind of smart and a reporter had called me to get some information on him. And I guess I just assumed he was, trying to get some background and talking to me for just information. And I was telling them everything I thought about the guy. And I said, hey, he's a good locker room presence. And he filled a real specific role. He did start, but he didn't play a lot. But I was kind of saying, I don't know if he can play at Georgia Tech. I don't really think he's going to be an impact player in the ACC and do this and that. I was kind of surprised, but I know it's close to where he's from. And the guy quoted me verbatim on everything I said. And I, I wasn't mad about it because I should have known. You, you, you got to know that off the record is something that's discussed and negotiated. And if not, I don't know. I don't think you got to know because that's, that's what reporters do. We compare notes all the time. I think that's the assumption. It's up to him to say he's interviewing you. Right. And he, and he didn't just use some of what I said. I think he quoted every single thing I said. And it sounded like I was really attacking this guy's game, but I was kind of just trying to tell this reporter, like, I don't know if I I wouldn't get too carried away with thinking this guy's going to be the starting center and really, make a difference. And he wasn't, but, and I never saw, I kind of smart again. I don't know if he ever saw that article, but I didn't mean to just blast him in the uh, Atlanta, Georgia paper as much as it came across. I think it was maybe more like a blog or something like that, but it was, you know, you gotta be, you gotta be aware when a journalist talks to you that just about anything you say could get quoted 
unless you, those parameters are set or you really know that this person is only looking for a little bit of a quote and everything else to say is more background. Um, I, I think it was my maybe responsibility to, to figure that out before we started talking. Yeah, I guess. But I, I, I think that it should be the default setting when two reporters are talking to each other is that you're comparing notes and it's not an interview. Um, I had two instances back when I was covering the Sabres. Uh, one, I recall uh, I was in the Islanders press box and a guy who was known as the ESPN insider. There was a, a subscription thing and this was years and years ago. I, I can't remember the guy's name. But he sat down and was asking me a couple of questions about the Sabres. And, you know, I, I told him, you know, his, his recorder's not out, his notepad's not out. And I just told him what I was hearing, a couple of things, things that I hadn't even reported. You know, it's just like, again, comparing notes. And a couple of days later, it was in, you know, uh, it was in the, his, his roundup of notes. A, a, a Sabres source was telling him, and it was what I told him. And I was the Sabres source. So that was unethical. And then there was another time I was in the Hurricanes uh, press box and somebody from their business paper, maybe it was a Cranes or, you know, Raleigh Business First or whatever it was, uh, was talking to me about something. I'm guessing it was the Sabres sale. Maybe it was after um, the Reguses had been arrested or Galasano had bought them. I'm not sure. But again, he had a notepad out, but it's still not uncommon. You're jotting down a couple of notes. And I realized I was being interviewed at that time. And I said, look, man, I don't believe in, I don't really believe in journalists interviewing other journalists. My, and I think it was my diplomatic way of saying, find somebody, you know, go do your own work. Um, because I didn't know this guy, I'd be happy to tell somebody, you know, I was like, all right. You know, so I told him I, I wasn't, wasn't interested in being interviewed and he thanked me and walked away, but um, yeah, it, it's weird. It's weird that way. Oh, so uh, I got away from it. Um, we were talking about coaches on the Mount Rushmore, and I wanted to mention two names that I think you'll agree with. If we were doing a coaches Mount Rushmore uh, from Western New York, uh, Mike McDonald and Joe Mahalik would be on it. Tough to beat. Those I would guys. say absolutely, Joe Mahalik. Joe Mahalik was one of the first coach I covered, but he was right up there with as one of the first coaches I covered, and. He was good to me, but what I always liked about Joe Mahalik, even when he didn't have the nicest things to say, he spoke in quotes. And you could tell that he was somebody that read the newspaper and knew what type of phrasing and what, when you're asking a question, you're not always looking for the most, you're looking for honesty, but you're not looking for the most direct answer. You're looking for that to be a prompt to get somebody to say something that can be used in your story or soundbite. And Joe Mahalik was very good at taking your question and turning it into a good answer, whether they won or lost the game and no matter what kind of mood he was in. And I think that came a lot from, I think he read newspapers and kind of wanted to see his quotes in print and knew how he wanted them to come across. Cause there's other coaches that as I'm doing right now, talking more meandering storytelling ways and they're friendly and you're doing the interview and you're like, this is great stuff. And then you're listening to your back and you're like, I don't have a full sentence here that I can put in print. That's going <laughs> right. to sound right. Or Turner Gill, who I liked. Doug Marone with. was good at that. Turner Gill was, he would speak in a way where he would cut himself off and, and make the sentences kind of awkward to where if you quoted him directly, you'd make him look stupider than he was. He wasn't, he didn't sound stupid when he was talking to you, but when you transcribe the quotes, the words would be in a weird kind of way, or he'd cut off the sentences in a way that it was hard to, put it all down on paper and make it sound as good as it should be. And I think there's a lot of coaches that do that. And sometimes I think that comes from trying really hard to be friendly and say everything that's in their mind instead of maybe having some, it's almost like writing. You want to talk and you want to write in short declarative sentences. And sometimes when you're answering questions, if you're a coach or an athlete, that's better. Now, Mike McDonald, who I like, I love having him on this show. And I see him around a lot and I talk to him and I interview him, but he to me does fall in one of these categories where I could talk to him all day with the tape recorder off and then you put the recorder on and it does get a little bit different. It gets a little more coach speaky and, and a little bit harder to quote. I, I, if I could quote everything that Mike McDonald's ever told me off the record, he'd be on my Mount Rushmore, but <laughs> on the record, I don't know if I'd put him on there. <laughs> all right. Fair enough. 
Uh, Jonah, thanks for this. John Beeline is someone I would. Oh, John right. Beeline falls into that category that I just mentioned with Joe Mahalik. Where? How about Jim Barron? Jim Barron was pretty good too, but he was very Mark Schmidt. rough a lot of times. Mark Schmidt is not very media friendly and not always quotable. He's gotten much, much better, at least from my okay. perspective over the years. But I just read a quote from Mark Schmidt. It's in here on Jeff Anastasia. And it's another one of these where it doesn't sound as good on paper as it probably did when he was saying it. And I don't mean this to bash Mark Schmidt. I don't think Mark Schmidt is one of the most quotable coaches. Nate Oates. Nate Oates, we should have brought up an hour ago. He belongs on the Mount Rushmore. He was very open, honest, right. quotable, tried to be funny, tried to be entertaining, didn't really keep too many secrets, even if they had lost. He was better after losses than wins sometimes. I would say he was absolutely one of the best coaches to interview. Felicia right. Leggett Jack. Is oh, another. right. Um, she's very quotable and personal. powerful. Has stories and anecdotes that she would try to share, even if your question didn't directly ask her about it. That's what I always appreciate when you can just ask a simple question and then they'll give you 10 answers and then you get to pick whatever <laughs> is the best one. Well, that was my point in the, in the satchel when I mentioned Lindy Ruff as, uh, as being on my Mount Rushmore is um, he could set the, the, the agenda because on practice days, he spoke first before you went in the locker room. So he could call out a player or say a specific thing. And you pretty much were compelled to go into the dressing room and then ask that player, Hey, Lindy just said this. Uh, and then because of NHL uh, uh, media guidelines, the locker room has to be open at a certain time. So we would go in there and then we would get Lindy after um, and I can't tell you the number of times where I left the Sabres locker room thinking, all right, this is my story. Uh, and I'm going to use this quote here and that quote there. And I'm planning out my, my story because I'm on deadline and I'm, I'm, I'm tight for time. And Lindy Ruff would say something that blew the whole thing up. And he was like, all right, well, there, Lindy did it again. He made the headline. Um, he knew, he knew how to channel words into, uh, into his team, uh, to, get guys motivated to maybe divert you from something, you know, you get playoff time and it'd be after a tough loss and he'd say something to get, uh, to get the other coach pissed off, you know, just, he just, he was good at that stuff. Um, he, he could, uh, he could command the coverage in, in some ways, but Jonah, thanks for this. Um, I'm sure I'll Take see time. you soon. And, um, uh, Thanks to everyone out there for listening to Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs, and business consultants. The financial needs of a business go beyond tax and attest services. That's why CTBK goes beyond accounting services and offers outsourced solutions through their affiliation with CFO Solutions Plus. These additional services allow clients to focus on their operational and long-term strategic goals. Trust CTBK's outsourced solutions to provide cost-effective, value-added financial services tailored to your company's needs. Call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400. Or go to ctbk.com to learn more about CTBK's outsourced solutions. We'll